Diana, land of many waters with her, six races living together. Globespan is a Guyanese dialogue moving towards the realization of one nation in one Guyana. It's a platform that offers an all-inclusive discussion, with the pros, the cons, the ones that is taken aside, and the ones that stand in the middle. Globespan believes agreeing and disagreeing are part of the nation's building. Globespan believes that every Guyan's voice is part of the nation's building. As we span the globe for voices from the diasporas, and those living home we stand on our commitment that we are all Guyanese working towards one nation in one Guyana. As the world turns on its axis bringing changes, we as Guyanese must adopt to those changes for a better Guyana for all. Globespan stands on its axis with its belief that one nation, one Guyana, one destiny must include voices from all corners of Guyana. Welcome to Globespan Television, coming live to you from New York. I will say a special thanks and welcome to all our listeners from far and wide. We are broadcasting tonight on education. Tonight we have with us Dr. Marcel Hudson. But before I introduce him officially, I want to say a special thanks to Noir Singh for making this program available every Monday night. And to Devin Bissoon and Brian Govin, our technical directors. So thanks to both of you guys and, Dr. and Mr. Noir Singh. Tonight we can be reached on Facebook, as always, and on YouTube. And I want to make this clear. The views are, of our guests tonight are solely those of the guests and not necessarily those of the management of Glowspan Television. So with that said, tonight's topic will be strictly in education. And we will start right now by welcoming Dr. Marcel Hudson, the former Chief Education Officer and the National Executive Director for the Accreditation Council. Dr. Hudson, welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Rose, um, for having me on this program. I count it a privilege to be a part of this program tonight. Thank you very much. You're very most welcome. Can you, since our audience don't know much of you, can you give us a background of yourself? Give us a picture, paint a picture of who you are and so forth. Um, well, Marcel Hudson um, was born in East Rangville. There's a village they refer to as Warlock. Um, born in that village, I lived in that village for 29 years. I left it, that community when I um, got married. Um, I'm a trained teacher, graduate of the Civil Public College of Education, um, 98 to 50 to 7 batch. I proceeded to the University of Guyana. Um, where I studied sociology as my first degree and subsequently I went on to do a postgraduate in education administration. I'm also a holder of a degree in theology and uh, um, I proceeded to do a doctorate in transformational leadership in Bucky Graduate University, Dallas, Texas. I've been an education officer for um, I've been in education for some 35 years plus. I've been in education from a school teacher, moving through the ranks of education. I became a district education officer. I worked in Region 2 and Region 4. I became regional education officer in Region 10. I became assistant chief education officer, um, uh, assistant chief education officer primary. Before that, I was principal education officer Assistant Chief Education of Deputy Chief Education Officer Development and uh, um, Chief Education Officer. So I think I hold the distinct, the distinct position of holding all the education positions leading up to the CEO, um, which meant that you know I come with some degree of experience as I move through the various levels um, of the education system. 
Thanks. That's a very good background. Now, how long have you been the CEO, the Chief Education Officer? Well, I, I became Chief Education Officer in 2017. And um, from 2017, I vacated that position um, about a year ago. I vacated that position and I became, I was appointed as Executive Director of the National Accreditation Council by His Excellency, the President of the after retirement and spending two extra years in the office. Um, I spent two extra years in the office as Chief Education Officer. Okay. Now, as a Chief Education Officer, can you tell our listeners what, you, what your role is, what you normally do? Well, fundamentally, the Chief Education Officer has to manage the delivery of education across the sector. And uh, that is a humongous task. But the thing about it is that you have a number of officers um, operating under you that you're able to execute your roles and responsibilities. So the issue ha has to do with, with policy, um, policy directive. Um, of course, you have the minister who is the overarching policy person and the uh, the chief education officer um, is part of the professional arm, is the head of the professional arm of the Ministry of, of, of Education. But overall, so you have to manage education across the country. You deal with the regions, regional education officers, and fundamentally it's policy and execution, implementation of policy. So the ministry has the, the country has 10 regions, so this means that you have 10 regional education officers. Yes, you have 10 regional education officers, and under the regional education officers, they have, um, they have what you call district education officers to help them to execute and deliver education at the, at the regional level. Okay, I didn't know about the district education officers. So... The, the programs they administer, it's universal across the country. Yes, the, pro the programs are, are um, universal. Of course, the regional education officer um, is also in a position to make some decisions based upon what is happening in that region in terms of education delivery. As a matter of fact, they call the, the regional education officer, many persons refer to the regional education officer as the CEO of that region because the okay. process is decentralized. Um, the regional education officer is um, fundamentally answerable to the regional executive officer. Um, as they're, they're paid from the votes from the region. And so they call it the Redo, as we say. Um, he's like the CEO of the region. He's in charge or she's in charge of education in the region. I want you to explain the difference for our listeners. What headmaster, what the difference between a headmaster and a principal? Well, in our context, there, there, is, no, um, there is no difference, really. Um, the Americans, for example, they refer to the head of the school, since the head of the school as the principal. Remember, we come from a British orientation, and in right, the British right. context, we refer to that course as the headmaster or the head teacher. Um, I know the Americans, they have this concept of, of, of the principal of the school. Well, um, in, in, in the United States, a principal is for a secondary school and a headmaster or headmistress is for middle school. No, in, in our context, they're, they're all, they're all uh, teachers in, in our context. So they're all at teachers, okay. Um, what happens sometimes, uh, I, I, sometimes in these very senior schools, like the Queen's Colleges and so on, some people refer to the, them as the principal, but they, fundamentally the duties are the same. It's the, the, the delivery of education at the school level, yeah. I want to go back to the colonial times, and I did, I did some research. During the colonial times, we had exams I think it started, okay, when you when you finish primary school, I think you write a school leaving exam, am I right? Well, 
the back in back in the in, in those days in colonial times yes yeah in colonial times yes you had that that school even and then after that you can go on to do cp which is a college of preceptors then gce then junior cambridge and senior cambridge explain what gce is what's junior cambridge and senior cambridge are well, the GC is a general certificate of, of education, and I came in that era. As okay. a matter of fact, the issue of, of CP and so on, preliminary exams and so on, um, I, I was not a product of that era. Um, but the general certificate of education, the GC, and that actually replaced, was replaced by the CSEC, the Caribbean Second right. Education right. Certificate. And so um, that, that is the secondary exam that our students write that will allow them to get into tertiary institutions and so on. But you have GC, you have ordinary level, and you had advanced level. Right, we had the ordinary level and indeed the advanced level. The advanced level, we have that now at Cape 2 the Caribbean uh, Advanced um, Certificate. Uh, so that's CAPE uh, too? Yes, CAPE, CAPE has replaced the, the advanced level of, of um, the General Certificate of Education. You used to call CXC it whole levels and CFC. And CXC replaced GCE? Yes, see, because okay. I think, I think what, 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 what one has to be mindful of is that you wanted to, to have an examination that would have been preparing our students for our context. It's not to say that GC was not, um, it, 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 it was incredible because I wrote GC too, but I think the Caribbean examinations um, really prepared our students to operate in, in our context. What do we need in our society? Um, because remember, the British system is different. We are Caribbean people. We are thinking about the system, how we want to advance, what we want our students to know. So it's no longer an issue of just um, reading and writing and so on. So we wanted our students to understand issues in relation to science, in relation to technology, and you know that kind of thing, so that as a people, we could, we, we could prosper and we could develop. And the only way uh, that is possible it meant that somebody would have had to carefully thought out a curriculum that suits our needs. And, and that has been happening um, beautifully. I, I have been a member of the, what you call the final award committee um, program in CCXC. That's, that's a body that looks at the grading system and how our students would have been performing and so on. And so in that setting, we were able to get an understanding as to where we are in terms of our agenda, our objective as a Caribbean people. I think that that's very important. I think education should serve the purpose of the people in that society um, first. And of course, it is so dynamic that you have to be learn to be functional in, in various societies. I always tell people, and so that is why we have not abandon um, everything um, as, as it relates to foreign examinations because you want to produce a student who is international, um, if, if I could say that. And so one has to be very mindful, but at the same time, you don't want to have students, um, the ideas are rooted in, in, in a context that is not suitable for, for one's country or nation or people. And I think that's where CXC has been very um, instrumental. And uh, I know for a fact that CXC would have gotten awards also for the sterling work that it has been doing over the years from international bodies. Um, because I know Dr. Uh, Wesley, in Wesley, who is the registrar of CXC, um, had those kinds of commendations. Uh, Dr. Hudson, correct me if I'm wrong. When you write GCE to be recognized, you should have five subjects, including English and math. CXC, I think, is the same thing, English and math. Am I right? 
um, there's a concept called matriculation. And um, matriculation um, is attainable when one would have had at least five subjects with English language and mathematics because those are those are universal um, universal subjects Subject. English and mathematics. So you have to you have to have those. Yeah. Okay. Now um, let me go back to something that you should know. What is junior Cambridge and senior Cambridge? Well, well, like I said, I, I, I'm not from that era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So okay. I, I wouldn't venture to tell you things that um, that I, I am not too familiar with, the junior and the senior Cambridge. Okay. Now, the teacher's training college, do you know, if you don't know, you don't know, do you know when it, when it came into being? Was during colonial times or after, after independence? The College of Education um, came into existence after, um, after, after independence. Yeah. So before independence, teachers are now being trained at a, at a college to teach. Well, we, I, I have to, I have to, um, to check the, the the history, the history on that. I know. Um, the college proper was after independence. Right. Now, how many years do you have to go to that college? Well, sir, part of the College of Education, it depends upon the program that you're doing. Eh? Um, you have what we call the, 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 the two-year program. There's a two-year program. And the uh, the associate degree, it's that's approximately that that would take you like 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 three years. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question because I got this from one of my our audience listeners. They want you to explain. After I had master, who is second in line in the school? <laughs> the, the the setting is that you have the, the headmaster and then there's a deputy. There's a deputy headmaster, and that has a lot to do with the um, with the numbers. All right, it has a lot to do with the number because some schools, based upon the numbers, um, based upon the numbers, you will have like you have schools, you have schools what they call grade A, grade B, C, D, and those fundamentally got to do with the numbers. I can't tell you all the numbers now, but the larger the school is, you have the you have the deputies. Um, some schools carry a deputy based upon the number. So the person technically in a large school after the headmaster is the deputy headmaster. And then you have senior masters, mistresses, and, uh, and so on. And then you have what we call the AMs, the assistant masters. If it's a secondary school, you will have something called, um, you will have a position called head of department. So the head of department, you find those persons in the secondary schools. They are responsible for a department like mathematics, a department that has the science department, the language department, you know, that kind of thing. So the, the, the structure is the, the headmaster, the deputy, then you have senior masters or mistresses, you have heads of departments if it's a secondary school. If it's not a secondary school, then you have the senior masters, mistresses, and then you have the assistant masters, or what we call AMs. Now, in Guyana, and this is another question again, my audience is sending me questions to question you. I know specialization is something that is not prevalent in the schools because I think this person is a teacher and she is telling me that even though she don't have a math background, she's asked to teach math, but her background is English and so forth, but she still have to teach math in the class. Is that prevalent across the country? A teacher teach more than one subject, even though it's not a specialization? Well, you would want somebody to function, you would want somebody to function in an area that they have capacity and that they're capable of, capable of functioning. I think, um, I think from my experience, when that happens, we don't have, um, normally what would happen is that persons who have a particular skill set in another subject area, that person 
um, is allowed to, to, to teach in that subject. But I don't think anybody um, in their right mind will ask someone to teach a subject that they don't have capacity to teach. But what I do know, um, sometimes we find a situation where there are some subject areas that uh, persons may not want to teach. Um, we have, we have, we, you know, you could find an interesting situation too, where someone is qualified in mathematics, and uh, because you have the qualifications, you should be taking um, the, the upper levels, if I could say that. You should be taking the upper levels, if I could say that. But um, strange enough. The person with the qualification sometimes give the other persons who might just be a college graduate to take charge in, in, in the subject area. But I think, um, let me tell you something though. Um, as a teacher, me, right? I remember, and you, you will permit me to share this. I will remember yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I left primary school. I left primary school. I was a teacher at primary school. And I asked for transfer to get to. Um, because I wanted to go to university, so I was transferred to secondary school. When I arrived at the secondary school, the head teacher sent me straight to forms three, or what we call grade nine, 10, and 11, straight to teach CSEC. You know what I did? No clue about the social studies program that she was asking me to carry. And so I remember going to President's College, I met a teacher there. I took the curriculum, I read it, um, meditated on it, and started to teach. And uh, you know what? I became um, one of the top teachers. I had 100% passes in the subject. Sometimes I share, I share that a lot with people. So um, sometimes it's, it's, it's not just ability, but it has to do with will. Um, and I always see teaching as a calling. And um, I take I I still teach just like I'm sure you still do some. Teaching. I always see teaching as a calling because it is it is such a wonderful thing to know that you could impact and change lives. But I I'm not advocating for someone who has no capacity um, to to teach a particular subject that because they will make a mess. They will make a mess. But there's also room for improvement and room for expansion by just availing yourself to learn and, 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 to, and to do better. But no one should be asked to teach something that they, they don't have capacity to teach. Uh, we have 10 regions in the country, and you were the chief education officer. During your tenure, which one of the regions, or any two or three of them, had the most serious problem requested your help most of the times? So, you, you fundamentally the, the, the hinterland regions um, they had difficulties and um, because the issue of of of, of equity and uh, what was something that had to be addressed and uh, it is important to know that the hinterland region has improved by leaps and bounds because of the concentration on those regions in terms of how they perform. We see the last, uh, for the last two years, we've seen um, we've seen the results coming out from the national grade six, uh, the results at C second so on. We have seen because lots of monies were put into the development of the interland regions and we, um, we've seen lots of monies placed there, we've seen what learning we've seen the establishment of learning channels we've seen the integration of technology in there we've seen teachers trained um the last batch before that we had 800 and something teachers this batch is a thousand so you would know dr rose that there is no one variable that will impact upon education transformation there is no one variable those of us who are scholars um, they will tell you that there is a multiplicity of variables that will impact the transformation of, of, of any education system. You, you have, you, and some of the key variables that you have, you have to have strong leadership. Um, you have to have a plan for improvement. 
and you, you also have to have strong parental involvement. And those are just some key variables. I think a gentleman by the name of Ati talked about 300 and something variables, and he reduced those variables to about 36. And yeah. all of these variables have to pull together. They have to pull together. You can't fix one, and you will know that as a researcher, Doc. You can't fix one variable when you have a number of variables impacted That's on true. the same thing. You have to fix all those variables at the same time, which is costly. Yeah, you have, that is have to fix those variables. And uh, I mean, uh, if we want to be fair, I have been around a long time and I have never seen the kind of monies um, put into education um, transformation like I've seen now. I've been around a little while and I guess um, all of that has to do with um, the, 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 the Ministry of Education, by extension, the government of Guyana has been constantly asking and, and for accountability in these areas. I had to account, I had to carry the education system during COVID. And at the same time, you know, you you want to um you don't want to blame blame anybody for performance. You don't want to blame a disease. So we were the first um we were the first in the Caribbean, as a matter of fact, the honorable minister will tell you persons used to call to find out what is it that we were doing in Guyana? We were the first to get worksheets into the into those communities. We were the first to ensure that um, school continued. We started to explore. Um, COVID has started so many things. Now look how we have in this conversation. We don't need to meet around the table. And um, you know, we we've had persons in the city teaching students in the interland area and so on. But the interland community. Um, was the um, those communities were were at, at at a disadvantage because of proximity and all of that. But all of that has changed um, in a few short short years. All of that has changed. And uh, if I want to be honest, because I can't I can't speak. I was around, so I know what I'm talking about. All of those things would have changed in a few short months because of the will. Like I said to you, Doc, it's not just commitment, but it has to do, or it's not just ability. It has to do with the will. And so I have seen, and I have been part of a willing body that wanted to see the transformation of education in this country, even in a time when we were in dire straits. But the hinterland regions were those regions at the time. Now, you've been around during colonial times with education, the teaching. I wasn't around during colonial times. I, I was, born, I was born in 1965. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Now I couldn't tell you about some of those exams that you were telling me about. Yeah. I know. Okay. Now, when you look at education going back, well, you should have. You, you, I th I'm sure you know about the colonial teaching methods and so forth. When you look at education going back to colonial times and look at the teaching methodology today. What changes do you think took place, if you, if you know of any? Yeah, I, um, I mean, as, a, as an educator research, you, you will do some reading and so on. But the, I, I, some of my readings, even as a sociologist, they spoke to this reading, writing, and arithmetic, that's what they call three R's, right? Right. And, right. Was, and that in itself, um, that in itself was so structured so positioned to suit the plantocracy or the colonial or the planters, the planting, the planters class, or as we say, plantocracy. And so it was fundamentally done to, 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 for you to be a support, not for you to grow and to expand, but basically to contribute to the development of, 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 of the colonial class. But after the experience, we saw a deliberate move to make sure that we produce people who are able to grow and to expand, people who are able to impact change and transformation of their own societies. And we saw that we saw that came into um, came into full force. And all of those things evolved as as we saw. We now see CXC because now we were writing our students were writing gc the advanced level and the um 
and the and the 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 O levels GC, and then we saw the transition. So CARICOM came together, and CARICOM said, "Look, we have to look at what it is that we need to. It is not that we are not going to collaborate and, and cooperate with other educational institutions." Um, for advancement or for development. But at the same time, we have to examine our situation and see how we could produce people that will provide a fit for the purpose of transformation in our context. And so um, there, was a, there was a vast difference because we were not uh, back in that time based upon my readings and study because I didn't come from that era or epoch. But we, we, we see now students are engaged in technology, science, and, and, and so on. Those subjects that are fundamentally technical and vocational education, those subjects that are fundamentally critical to transforming a nation. When you look at the developed world, the Japans, you look at the, um, the United States the, and, and, and Canada, those, the, the education, technical and vocational education is, is critical to them. And the, that has been one of the things on our front burner right now. I think um, now we will, in my last days, we had something called Tibet on the move. And now um, I, I noticed the DCO technical now, Dr. Richard Tularam, he is championing that cause, getting our people to understand, look, we are not just consumers, but we can build things. We can make things. You understand? I mean, we can make things and export. We can develop ourselves and not depending on people for every everything technological. And so our people, in my view, they are smart and bright to know because they have been allowed to grow and, and, and to expand. And there is no curtailing of, of what is being taught and how it is being taught. And so, of course, we learn from the developed world. We collaborate with them. Um, but we still have to make sure that we do what is necessary for our own advancement and our own development of our people. Uh, Dr. Hudson, I'm sure you're aware of this. During your time and before and so forth, and even today, school dropouts in Ghana, I think, was about the highest in the Caribbean. Do you know where it is today? I, I think um, those numbers, we had someone by the name of Evelyn Hamilton um, you probably would have known her. She was the CPO, and those numbers have reduced, um, have been reduced considerably. Um, I, I don't have an exact figure at this point in time, but I know that it is far below. Uh, it, it's not. I think the last time I heard from the CPO, it was like like two percent or something like that. And there are a number of reasons why you might find um, persons my drop out of school. So um, I have noted that we have been doing some things uh, like, for example, we have school feeding programs now. Um, I could remember um, people used to complain that they don't have, they don't have anything to eat. Um, children, um, they're, not, they're not being nourished and some parents complain that they don't have money, uh, monies and so on to send children to school. Some parents, some children have to, uh, but these are not large numbers. Eh? Um, some persons uh, complain about financing children, and you see that um, they have this issue of cash grant for children. You have school feeding for our children, um, the issue of textbooks being given to our children um, instead of parents having to go and buy you now basic textbooks and, um, and, 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 and these things. So, this, this thing, you see, Dr. Rose, like I said, a number of variables we have to take into consideration, yes. right? And so if you, if you start to look at those variables and they pull together, because the delivery of education has to be holistic in nature. Jeffrey Sachs will tell you that. You know, yeah. the end of poverty, that book, a beautiful book, The End of yeah, Poverty. Yeah, I know it, yeah, yeah. He will tell you that. You have to fix these variables. And there's a conscious effort, in my view, for these variables to be fixed. And once these variables are being fixed, constantly you will see those numbers. Um, thing. We had, of course, you had other issues too of teenage pregnancy. Um, persons have to drop out. Now we have a policy 
that deals with reintegration and I, 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 I am one who really admire that um, to see young girls who became pregnant came back and wrote CXC and, and passed five and six subjects and went on to university because somebody decided that look we're going to give them a second chance and not brand them as discards and waste of time because they make some mistakes because the crux of the matter is all of us make mistakes it's just that some are known and some are not known by people, but all of us make mistakes. And so we've had young ladies and uh, young men who, be, who, who actually impregnated women, um, girls, uh, in the school system. You know, there was a time when you would have, they would have been discards because the first thing is that, you know, the reputation of the school, when we look at the school and how they will be viewed, what people will say about them and so on, those things, um, um, those things have systematically um, been addressed. Yeah, I, I read where World Rights Study show that poverty is the number one cause for school dropouts, and it's still a problem worldwide, not only in Ghana but in every country. When kids don't have money, the parents can't afford to send them to school. They just try to go and get a job or something. Now, at one time, UG was free under the PNC government. Do you think that was a progressive move, in your opinion? I, I benefited from I benefited from uh, from part of it, um, okay. part of that freeness. And then I could remember I could remember the year when when I started. I think by my first. Two years I, I was in Google in my first two years and then because I was a part-time student right part-time meant that I worked and attended classes the full-time people part-time students actually spent four year, five years at UG um, full-time students spent four years because you had to do your um, your, the your thesis and I remember um, I remember having to pay in the last couple of years um, prior to, to graduation. Um, education is a costly exercise. A costly exercise is one person if you think it's expensive, try not knowing anything and see how costly that could be. Um, I've been hearing um, talks and I think um, there is move to go in that direction, in that direction, but I'm sure that that is a process that has to be processed and so on because you know, there's also a view that people value things things more than they pay for. I mean, you and I, I don't know if you had a scholarship or what, but I have to find all the US dollars to pay for that. So I could tell you, Doc, I'm not failing anything. I'm not failing anything. I'm not playing around because I got to find all these thousands of US dollars. But I think it would be a good thing if, um, if that move is implemented. And I, I, I've been hearing that that is one of the... I think President Ali said, I think next year you will be free. No, I went to school all from my undergraduate all through with scholarships. Never paid a dime at the university. But that was in Canada. <laughs> wow. In Canada. For the doctor there too? Yeah, everything. Montreal. I didn't pay a dime for education. Oh. oh. So the, the thing is, the Canadian government had a system. Well, each province, there are 10 provinces which you know. And when you finish high school, you write a provincial exam. And if you gain 90%, or no, 95% and higher, you get a free education all the way to a PhD, to a law degree, to whatever you want to do. Oh, I can between, see. Between 90 and 94.9%, .9 you'll get what is called a free education up to a, a master's degree. And below that, you don't get anything. And when I wrote the provincial exam, I was through the entire province. I think it was about, I don't know, maybe about almost 500,000 students through the exam. And I was third. I, I don't think, Doc, it, it, it's a question that you didn't have to pay a dime. You know, I don't think, it's, I, I think you had to do some work. I thought you, I thought you were just gliding through the system. But you no, were, no. I had to study hard for the, for the provincial exam and I got 98%. And two kids beat me out. One got 98.6, one got 98.8. Because if you, if you, um, you have to position yourself 
to get yeah. there. It is time to mount a scholarship because try getting 50 something and 60 and see if they would have passed you through even to the doctoral level. Uh, I no, don't think that no. would have been possible. You know, I am not boasting, but in all my bachelor's degree, I had one B. All the rest were A's and A minuses. And now I got a B is a summer course that taught a European professor came and taught us a summer course. And when he gave me a B, he left the country, so I couldn't confront him or anything. I said, oh, how come I got a B? But in my masters, I did two masters, I got the all straight A's, the PhD is the same thing. But I was a full-time student. I, let me say that. Never worked. You, you've never had to, to argue for grades? No, I was a full-time student. Well, I, I could tell your position. Um, the, 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 the rubric, the grade, the rubric for the doctoral level was very high. And so um, I, I was getting, I was getting by this particular professor, I think the course is people development and management. And she started off giving me, um, I think it was 96, I think it's an, it's an, 98 is A plus. Right, yeah. 98 is A plus, and I got a couple of 96 and so on, and then, which is an A, and then she tried reducing that in, in another course, 96 to 94, which is, but I call, I call it late, you know, I said, here's something. I noticed that I, but the lady said, you were the best in the class. But what she doesn't understand is that is, uh, I am not concerned with being the best. I'm setting targets. And you see, this is the thing what people need to do. You know, you need to set targets and, and stay on target. Um, some people use other people's standards to measure to themselves. I don't function like that. I, don't, I create my own standards and I try to live to my standards. So don't tell me that I'm the best in the class, but I notice I move from 9 to 6 to 9 to 4. All right, so um, I, I think after I spoke to her, it, it, it has never uh, been done for them. <laughs> well, to do a PhD in the States, you have to write, I forgot the exam, you have to write to be selected. It's, the name is not coming to my mouth, but you have to write at the exam for us, which is uh, an exam fast pace. It's it got nothing to do with academics, though. And yeah. then based on your grades, your marks from that, you can use that to apply to universities. Anyway. Enough about me, because most of my friends thought I was too privileged. But I never worked. To, I never worked. I went to school full time, so that's that's a different story. And if I'm going to school full time, I got no right doing poorly in classes, because that's all I had to do. Now, you are an executive national ex executive director for the accreditation council. What is that? What what we do there? So. I am out of the school system proper. I'm mm -hmm. director of the executive director of the National Accreditation Council. What we look at um, for secondary and uh, tertiary institutions. So there are a number of institutions, and with the advent of the oil and gas sector, you know, lots of forces are coming together and they want to establish um, institutions that are either post secondary or tertiary. And so our role is one of quality assurance. Our role is to ensure that whatever persons are offering, um, it is of quality. And we also have to protect people from people who might be unscrupulous in terms of in terms of in terms of, of their approach and their delivery. So we have what we call um, registration, which is by law. Um, the, the National Accreditation Act of 2004 clearly states that any institution operational in Guyana must be registered. And if they're not registered, well, then um, they, they could be fined $250,000. And so the next level from registration is that of accreditation, where they have to engage in a self study. In other words, they have to prepare like a strategic document to show how this, this institution will function and, uh, and uh, what would be the projections in the future and so on. And that's the accreditation. So I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the concept. I, so just, I, I just completed one for our university here, but go ahead. So once you are accredited, you know that that, that is not a lifelong process. Maybe Every five years. In five years, and then you have to come again. And all of yeah. that has to do with quality assurance because some people, you know, could fall by the wayside because nobody's watching 
nobody's checking. And so we don't know the kinds of students that you're producing um, and how impacting they will be when they're released into the um, thing. So the issue of accreditation has um, many benefits, benefit to the, to the, uh, benefit to the employer, because the employer knows now that whatever he's getting or she's getting, student is of quality, the student has substance, um, and the student also, um, because of coming from an institution that is accredited, it means that the student will, you know, they could be considered as somebody of repute. And of course, the nation, of course, the nation. Our president has been talking about producing a world-class education system. And here are people like us um, at the council, we have a critical role to play to make sure that what courses are offering, it, they're offering something of substance and uh, they're offering um, courses that are beneficial to our nation as we seek to advance as a people. So basically, the Accreditation Council does that. There are aspects of supervision too, where every now and again we are monitoring visits just to make sure that you're in par. Because not because you have been received a five-year um, lease, if you want to say that. It means that nobody's watching you and you could just slip into oblivion and do your own thing and so on. So monitoring visits are made to those schools and so on. And so um, we also provide a service that... I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this topic. We must pause them for a commercial break. But folks, don't go any place. We'll be back within a minute. Take it away, Devin. Or Ryan. Globespan 24-7 is serving the community for over two years. We hope that the programs have been of value to you as we continue to connect with the issues and politics that matter to you. Support Globespan 24-7 initiatives by logging on to Globespan247.com. Click on Globespan 24-7 talk shows and make a contribution. Your contribution will help to build a better platform for the communities. On Globespan 24-7, you can also download the player for Roku TVs, Samsung TVs, and Android TV boxes. You could also download the Globespan 24-7 channel on your Android mobile phone. Support Globespan 24-7 and also support the companies that support Globespan, such as Travelspan and AllFromOneSupplier.com. Unveiling a literary masterpiece challenged sovereignty by Dr. Ivla Lloyd Griffith. This book demonstrates how drugs, crime, terrorism, and cyber threats converge, shaping the destiny of the Caribbean. Twelve years in the making, this groundbreaking study unravels the complex tapestry of challenges facing the Caribbean including regional analysis and compelling case studies. Grab your copy of Challenged Sovereignty by Dr. Ivla Lloyd Griffith with an exclusive 30% discount at the University of Illinois Press or available on Amazon.com. Welcome back to Globespun. Tonight we have with us Dr. Marcel Hudson, the former Chief Education Officer, now the National Director for the Accreditation Council. Dr. Hudson, there are several universities in Ghana right now, but how many of them are accredited? Well, like I said, um, we, have, we have the Police Academy has been accredited. We have a school called the CMB, College of Education Management. Um, that has been also accredited and we have the Art Williams Aeronautical School um, at Ogle that has been accredited. But like I said, the University of Guyana is on the verge of, of, of being accredited. There are aspects, the, the program, for example, the medical program is accredited by CAMHP. They have a huge task to, um, in terms of getting to that level and I know they're working um, feverishly to here, um, but the law of our country clearly states that registration is is fundamental. Registration is a must, and uh, you could move towards accreditation. Since I have assumed the office of the executive director, my thing is is that all the schools, post secondary and tertiary, should come to that level, and uh, 
Right now in the pipeline, we have several um, schools that are going through the process of accreditation. Um, you know, I, I, I am someone who likes to, to, to reflect on information and questions that you asked. And so some information came to me that formal initial teacher training began in the year 1928. Um, over the decades, Syracuse College of Education came into, um, came into existence. It was, it was called a teacher training institution in 1928. I was not even a zygote at that stage. <laughs> okay. So the accredit your accreditation council, there must be, you have to accredit them based on what they submit to you. But what criteria are you using, the accreditation council using to give them accreditation, to certify them? It's a, it's a, it's a lengthy process. Um, you have these standards that they, ha that they have to meet. Standards um, that deals with, for example, um, the professional arm of the school, who they have teaching there, with the qualifications of the persons. You look at the courses, what they are offering, um, the significance of those courses to our developmental process. Um, they have to do what we call a self-study plan. And that plan is like a, it's like a thesis document which speaks to the whole gamut of activities of the school. Um, and so you have like 28 standards that they have to complete. And um, each one of those standards, standards um, they have substandards. And so um, those were, we had um, some persons who worked on that and they are associated with Tanquet and Umkehi. These are international bodies that, you know, give us the kind of advice and information as to how, um, because we subscribe to those um, bodies, and so we are able to be exposed to workshops, seminars, training um, in relation to that. So it's a tedious thing. It's an entire document that they have to complete. Um, and so once that is done, um, we the council is managed by a board. So this is not Dr. Hudson. Now you have a board of professionals, um, a lot of PhDs and so on. And so you have to make that presentation to the board and the board could very well say, look, at this point in time, based upon what I see, these persons are not ready for accreditation. Let them go back and do A, B, C, and so on. So it's not a walk in the park. Of course, some people could become very annoyed because of the process, but accreditation is not a quick fix. It's not something that you could just say that you want and person hand that to you because one of the things I normally tell people, if you go in that direction, you have these international bodies who could come at your country at any time and say, I noticed this school is accredited. Let me see how you have arrived at this position. And so one has to be very careful in how um, that kind of uh, role is executed. One has to be very careful. But is your accreditation council linked to any international body? Like uh, at my university, we have to do it every five years. And I was the head of the committee at this time to do it. And it was a lot of tedious work and it took us about six months. But the thing is, we got to send it to the Northeast Accreditation Council, where all the universities in the Northeast will send theirs there. But my question to you is this, if they put in writing that they're doing X, Y, and Z, how would you know they're doing it or not? Do you send observers to make sure that these things are taking place at the university or the school or whatever it is? Yes, yes, we have, um, and I'm glad you raised that, because we have what we call, we call evaluators. And so right, right. those evaluators are hired and they're paid a reasonable sum of money to do that. And so the evaluator has to be someone um, who, has, who has a special skill in a particular area. So, for example, if a school is offering medicine, the evaluator or evaluators will be several um, doctors, medical doctors of, of repute that we know. And so even when the evaluators submit their evaluation, it has to go to another committee now of, of professors, another committee of persons to determine whether um, what the evaluators would have produced. So it's like you have a watchman watching the watchman. And so th that kind of thing. So nobody, nobody gets a free pass. So visits are made to the schools. Questions are being answered. Like I said, the, 
the standards, they have to meet those standards. You meet the, the you meet the faculty of the school or of the university, and they have to respond to those standards. They have to give evidence. It's not a talk shop where you say, "Oh yes, I have this here. Let me see the evidence of what you're saying that you have." And so the process is it's, it's a tedious process, and it is consuming, time consuming. I know, I I know I I know the process thoroughly because I did it. I'm doing I did it for the past maybe this is my third time I'm doing it and I think this is the last anyway because uh, it's a lot of work and and uh, you get very very nervous at times now let me go back to secondary education Queen's College Bishop's High School Borbis High School are the three known secondary institutions in Guyana that are the top of the top, or the creme of the creme. And this has been known from day one. If you get a chance to go to Queen's College, you come out, you get a good job. Bishops, the same thing. Borby High School, the same thing. Oh, but we have, um, you're missing out. You, 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 you have another set of schools there. You have Queen's College, you have the Bishops High School, you have St. Stanislaus College, you have St. Rose's High School, and you have, um, the St. Joseph's High School. Yeah, but 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 I'm I'm saying the top three though, that has been known in Guyana. Oh no, those, those are not the top three. The top three is the the top five is what I've just called. Okay, okay, the top five. Okay, but my question to you is this: These schools have a good reputation. The reputation is so good that teachers will gladly go to teach there. My question to you, and by extension to the minister of education, the Ministry of Education, and also to the government. Why don't you build up the other schools to produce that level of education by providing them with good, solid teachers and programs and everything else? Why the other schools are, are, are kept the way they're being kept at a lower level than these four, five, or six schools? Why can't they equalize these schools? I, 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 I hate to say it because I have been I have been around, and so if you were saying that is an is an indictment against me, and um and, and, no, not, and it, it, it existed long before you. No, no, but remember now, I I was a sitting CEO for the past um for, for about four, 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 five years, somewhere around right. there, right? right? And I could tell you, I think that's what I I explained to you earlier that. There, is a there has been a deliberate effort. You know, the first thing, um, when I came back, I, I remember the Honorable Minister saying, Dr. Hudson, um, how could we, the same question that you were, the same issue that you were raising here, how could we get the other schools to, um, to perform um, like the QCs and, and the Bishop's High School and so on? And so we were now tasked with developing a plan of action to raise the level, and so this is what a lot of people don't know. Since then, you have the Anna Regina Multilateral School, um, the Anna Reg in Region 2, has been challenging QC in terms of the top position. Um, for the past two years, Anna Regina has been doing that. Then we have on the West Bank, not, not on the West Bank, across the um, in West Demerara, you have the West Demerara Secondary School, um, and so you have you have lots of schools now, even in the outlying areas in the hinterland communities that are now stepping up because of a deliberate action in supplying teachers, supplying textbooks, using technology to meet them, and so um, the, the the landscape, Doctor Rose, the landscape has been changing, and it will continue to change based upon. I mean, I am not. Um, I'm no executive director, but I'm still part of the education system, and I call upon every now and again to um, to make these interventions and to work with persons. The landscape of education is changing. We are not where we want to be right now, and, and, and we're not going to make bones about that. We're not where we want to be, but the landscape. I'm telling you, from nine, from I, I from 1987, I became an education. I became a class teacher. And the landscape of education has changed significantly 
in terms of um in terms of performance of school. So the usual suspects are not not the the, the, the um they, they don't hold any transport to performance now. The, the, like I said, Anna Regina has been challenging the Queen's College. Um, you have West Demora, you have Borbis now. You have Borbis High. These schools are now doing CAPE. They are now doing the Caribbean Advanced Level because of the input that has been placed in there. But it's a good thing that you're saying. It's important. At the end of the day, if you don't have all those schools build up to a certain level, you have a question, you have a situation now where people are clamoring um, for, 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 for space. There's an issue of space. So every school now has to perform. Every school has to perform because if, if QC could only take so many children, since Danish law, since Bishop law, so it is incumbent now upon those schools to step up. And I know that there have been deliberate efforts to ensure that those schools rise to a certain level. Not just secondary school, but the primary schools too. Because there are people who are fighting to go to certain primary schools, which means that the primary schools, you know, they also must perform. They have to perform. We have an issue. Um, I know you have not asked this question, but we have an issue with literacy. We want to get our children to read. We have an issue with literacy. Right? And I'm putting that to you now. And so there's an entire unit that has been designed to deal with literacy. But what I, from my study, my dissertation actually had to do with, 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 with literacy. And I could tell you, what I have discovered is that, you know, I took a particular school. Um, what I have discovered is that when everybody, they're placed in, in, in a single place and they're all told what, what has to happen, and they're monitored and they're given the kind of resources. I have seen how transformation took place because I did what I mean you're familiar with the two tests and so on. Looked at the results the children were getting, applied what we call a holistic method, brought the education officer of that school, brought the teachers, did this eight, eight week intervention with them and uh, allowed them um, some, some span, um, some time, and then came back and uh, took that score and by virtue and the children increased. You see, the, the thing is, I think there's a misconception that education delivery is a one-man show and um, it, it can't happen. There must be collaboration. There have to be collaboration among the stakeholders because I always tell people when there are 24 hours in a day, a school time might be six hours, let us say the child goes to school. We have what? Approximately what? We got another 18 hours left. What do we do with that child for the next 18 hours? Of course, you take out some time to sleep. Let us say they sleep for an, another eight hours. So eight and six is 14, right? You still have 10 hours. What do we do? And here is where the issue of parental involvement and parental guidance is important. And don't tell me that because you didn't go to university as a parent, your child has to be like you. My father was never a university man. My mother, she was a simple woman. She never even went far in school. But they advocated for performance. They advocated for performance. And so um, I, I think that the, the role of parents now um, got to be brought sharply into focus. Because the school is no, the school is not a daycare system where you just drop off and so on. You have to now start working with those children. And the, the literature will show you, Dr. Rose, that parents who are integrally involved in the developmental process of, of the children's education, those, those students tend to, tend to perform better, especially fathers, if all, because fathers, when fathers decide to take education seriously, you know by nature we're competitive. You want your, your child or everybody to, to, to be on top. And, and that, even at the football game, you see in America sometimes, you know, football game fights break out, <laughs> you know, because... Uh, in, in all the sports. Right, because of the competitive nature of, of fathers. But I believe yes. the time has come where, um, where parents... I, I don't know, you, I'm, I'm sure you heard about uh, Ben Carson. Um, so yeah. nice. Yeah, he was he was president yeah. from I think secretary for housing. I think big and gifted arms. It's one of the 
was not, no scholar and the mother raised him, but the lady, had, those guys said that the, the, when they recognized that the mother couldn't read is when she was attempting to hold the book and the book was turned upside down. And so, but the lady advocated for performance and we know he became one of the world's greatest neurosurgeons. So parents could make an impact and you don't have to be a scholar to call your child to perform. All you got to say, this is no play time now, this is time to study, take your book, do your revision, follow up, visit the, the school, ask how my child is performing, those kinds of things. These are very simple things that parents can do to cause their children to perform better. I'm glad you touched on that, but I'll come back to that. Now, we are talking about UG and you said some school in Anna Regina and other areas catching up. But uh, Dr. Hudson, in all due respect though, as long as you have CXC, the students with the highest grades will always be siphoned off to UG, Bishops, Barbisa, and those places. And that's what's telling me that the system will not change. System will change because you have you also have technical institutions, you have you have the GTIs, you have the, the technical institutions, and lots of children. As a matter of fact, let me tell you something now. The people who make money is not the persons like you and I who sit in the office and we have PhDs and so on. We have persons, look, a man come at my house and he the turn two things and tell me $200,000. So what, 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 the man provide a service? I can't tell him no because he gave me what I wanted. So we, we have to understand too that um, our children will go off into different, into different fields of education. Not all of them will become professors and, and so on. My son, for example, he has no interest in, in, he wants to be a robotic engineer, he wants to play cricket. So he joined a cricket club, but he's a bright chap, so he would want to carve out. But I'm saying to you, Doc, um, in all fairness, that um, lots of work have been done and I wouldn't conjure up anything to say that we are where we want to be. Um, we are not where we want to be, but I believe with the constant push and the vigor and the energy that we are seeing now from the sector, in a few years, we will be, I, I believe in a few years, we will see real change because they have been advocating for change. There is a call for accountability. How could you have the state calling for accountability and you relaxing and laughing? So, you know, that, that has implications. So. Um, I believe in, in, in a few years we will we will see. But you know, like I say, um, um, it has to be holistic in nature. It, it can't be a one man or the Ministry of Education. All of these units got to pull together for the effectiveness that that that, that we want to see. It can't be a one man show. I know, and I know the Minister of Education, Ms. Pierre Khan, she is trying her very best to give the best education to the children out there. I know that for a fact. I have a question here. You know when a kid goes to kindergarten school, they depend on, they get 100% attention from the teachers or who's ever there to talk to them or teach them and so forth. But when they go off to primary school, that drops down to about 80%. This means that they got to do the 20% of the work on their own. In the garden, the kids don't have to do anything on their own. They just go there, paint, draw, whatever it is, go home, that's it. But in primary school, they got to do about 20% of the work on their own. In high school, they have to do about at least 35 to 40% on their own. At the university, they have to do at least 40 to 50% on their own. Are the schools in Guyana preparing the secondary school preparing these kids for university education based on what I gave you there? These are national figures, it's not mine. That when they go to university, they don't expect to be taught everything. They've got to get up and go and do the research, write papers and so forth. Right, I, 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 I agree with you. So it's, we call it nursery school. I guess that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, nursery. kindergarten or nursery school. They get 100% attention. They don't have to do anything. But primary school, they start getting homework. The kids got to do at least about 20% on their own. High school, they got to do at least about 30 to 40 percent on their own. But at the university, they got to do at least about 50 to 60 percent on their own. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's true. And here is where uh, transitional programs are important. Um, transitional programs. 
uh, children got to be prepared, and that is something that has to has to be um, to be re-examined. Children got to be prepared to transition from one level to another, and so that has to be deliberate. You know, one of the things that we used to do, and I'm sure it still happens now. Uh, I don't know to what level, but one of the things that we used to do is in the last term, in the last term, we had children spending time in that because how this thing was so structured, you had like, um, you had in the same compound, you had children from the prime nursery going into primary. And so in that last term, the children used to go and spend like two weeks in the primary school to start getting a feel with their teachers as to what to expect because like you said i mean they're babies right and so you have to be very careful you have to look out for them and so on um the, the, the issue of being potty trained and all of that when you go over now uh, into primary school you, you you have to be ready for so many things as how you identify those percentages um and, and that's important transitional programs um so a child shouldn't wait until they um they're placed into secondary school to, to to get a feel not secondary primary school to get a feel of what primary schooling is like you know a transitional program could be developed so that they at least the, the, that kind of weight could be removed from them and some of them could be scared because you're now going into a different environment where the teacher is a little different um and uh, the secondary system now is, is, is even more scary because here it is now, you have children doing group work and all of that, um, you're on your own, you, so there, there is, you still have to get guidance and that's, that's one of the things that I think we need to, to see happen. More guidance with us just releasing some of these children at the secondary school, particularly at the low grades in the secondary schools. Um, as they grow old and they move into fifth form, and I could understand that. But one of the things I discovered after those is that when when we had gone to the University of Guyana, we had we had very limited back in the day, limited exposure to research, and so um, you had children. Uh, you know, I remember. I don't know if you know Mr. Paris, Michael Paris. He was he taught applied sociology. Um, no, I don't know him now. Michael and, Ma and Malcolm, um, um, they, those were two brothers, they were twins. And uh, it, was like, it was like magic when these guys started to talk about chi-square um, chi analysis of variance and all these things, and how you're doing the research and you, you're putting data together and so on. But you know what? With the school-based assessment now, um, that the children, they have to go through that process as they transition. Um, they, they're now gi given an opportunity to do research. And so when you go into university, you don't go as, as a man with no basis or a man with no, found in, no, with no base or no foundation. And so, um, and that SBA thing, it's the kind of transitional pro because it prepares you when you go to university, you know, you know you are on your own. You know, let me give you a joke. I, I, I have a, um, a bachelor's in theology. And I remember um, the professor then from the United States of America. I said, I went to him, I said, Dr. Jim, um, you give me this question, right? And uh, I would just like you to, um, to, to tell me how, you, how I should answer the question. The, Dr. Jim just popped in my shoulder and he said, Marcel, you're a bright guy. I'm sure you're going to figure it out. It's, he's finished with me. You know, I figured it out. He finished with me. So you're right. So you're left in those guys who are not going to bring any spoon and put it in your mouth. You want to be, you want to be, you want to have a master's, you want to have a degree, you want to have a PhD. You have to be willing to put in the work and not somebody handing you this thing on a platter. You know, and so, and so you're right, Doc. And I think one of the things I would advocate for now is these transitional programs. They were there before, but I think um, we could spend more time looking at how we could allow children to experience long beforehand what they, what they will experience in the secondary school. Because some of them, let us be frank, some of them, they're shell-shocked. If they're not prepared for it, they could be shell-shocked. 
Because you go into an environment now where you have to move from classroom to classroom. There's no no um, no rows anymore. There is no Hudson anymore that you're familiar with throughout your, the class. You have several people now who you have to engage. And they have different styles, different behavior patterns. Children, some children just, just can't handle those kinds of situations. So to my mind, they have to be trained and they have to be prepared for it. And strong transitional programs, to my mind, will be um, a good solution. Uh, maybe not the only thing, but a good solution to, to the issue that you were mentioning. I was reading an article written by this guy, Kit Maynard. I think he's a lecturer at the University of West Indies. I don't know if he's a, if he's a doctor or a lawyer. I, I really don't know. But uh, he is saying that one of the things that have not changed from the colonial times is the teaching methodology, which kids in the Caribbean and most colonial societies are taught to cram and not learn. In other words, you prepare kids for CXC or whatever exam you're them for, you give them tests before, they cram that and they go into the exam and write it. In other words, what he's saying, kids should learn to understand the basic concepts so that they can explain it after. But if you're going to cram, then you can't learn and explain it after. Did you find that in Guyana, among the two kids? There are some persons who, who are exam, examination oriented because at the end of the day, Dr. Rose, um, results <laughs> is what comes to people there. Eh? People want the results. That that is important for people. Um, they want to see that they get the five subjects or the six subjects, and the, the best way they can get it, if it has to do with cramming and so on, um, that's what they will do. Um, you know, there's a book written by I think is um, the Pedagogy of the Oppressed. It's it's a revolutionary education book. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think I read it. Yeah, by by Freer. Right. Freer. A Brazilian, I think, pedagogy press, and, and the same thing that you were talking about, where the teacher was, uh, the, the pedagogy is oppressive in that you're not allowing critical thinking to flow. You're 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 telling and you're telling and and um, I, I I had a teacher once who said, give me back exactly what I uh, what I what the notes I give you. Now there is no room for expansion. There's no growth room for growth. <laughs> critical thing. That's pedagogy of the oppressed. And so I, I, I believe that, um, I believe no, because that's one of the skills that we, that is tested at the level of CSEC, critical thinking, that that's a skill that has to be tested. So, and that has to do with problem solving. You're given problems and you have to solve it. And so um, you may have a, a group of people who, who, um, who might cram stuff, but to my mind, that doesn't help you as you go forward. All right, that doesn't help you because uh, I sure you don't have no paper in front of you. Yeah, you don't have no paper in front of you. But if I have to, you know, have to, if, if you're a crammer, you can't be, you you can't be, be clear uh, and, 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 and progressive in your, in your thought process. And so um, uh, if forces are practicing that, like I said, results, it matters to people. However you get it, it's important. And I, if a man is good at cramming, that's his ability. Um, but I would advise that if you cram and that's your ability, make sure that you also learn. Because you're going to come a time when you don't have any information or anybody to help you. Like, how oh, you're putting me on the spot. In some cases, you catch me, right? <laughs> because, because of the issue of data and but if, if, if I had not learned, if I hadn't learned, I can't have this conversation with you. You know, this, this meeting would have done a long time ago. And so that's what people have to understand. Because when you now assume an office and you can't speak, you can't articulate matters, you can't address issues, you find yourself in a quandary. And that is why learn is, learning is important. And teachers got to understand the importance of having of being advocates of, of critical thinking you know i think it's, it's, it was william ward who said that the, the the um the mediocre teacher fundamentally tells which is like oppressive but the teacher who is excellent the teacher inspires i always tell people that that teaching is not about um 
you know, if you are not, if you can't take me from nothing and make me into something, you know, there are those who are of the view that if the child hasn't learned, the teacher hasn't taught. And, um, you know, I think when I was doing some research, it was said that only 3% of the children in any classroom setting may not be able to learn and uh, they have identified um, some issues that may be responsible for that. They might have some kind of impediment that we don't know about. They might have some something working against them, extreme poverty or something working against them, only 3%. It can't be the other way around. It can be 97% not learning and only 3% learning. And that is what data is all about. When, when people look at data, they must understand that if the research is showing that, it is incumbent upon you as an educator to change the status quo if it is the other way around. Because only 3% of the children, this research has said, are incapable of learning, and that is because of some impediment. It can be 97% of the children can't learn and only 3% learning. And so um, this is where um, the role of a teacher is fundamental because um, research will tell you that the teacher is the most single critical person in, in the whole, in, in, in this whole education delivery process, the one who stands in front of you. And I always say that teaching is not about being bright. And maybe people may not agree with me. It's not about being bright. It is about being able to capture the hearts of people by skillfully doing what you do. Because I have been in classes where um, people are very intelligent, the PhDs and so on, but when you leave there, you don't know one thing that they talk about. <laughs> you have not learned anything. Because it's not about being bright. It's not about a whole set of formulas on the board and you walk away. It's about capturing the hearts of people and motivating them to learn. And that is the role, that, that is what real professors and teachers do. They are facilitators of learning. You know, it's not to make sure that people don't graduate. I have had experiences where people said that, you know, we can't graduate all of these people and so on. Um, it is not. You know the bell corp, everybody wants to make yeah, sure that yeah, you know, yeah. You have the people, in, you, you know, the majority in the center, and you have the two extremes and so on. But I don't know what is your view on that. But I think you could have a cohort of people who are very intelligent and they might cause your cohort to skew. I don't know. But um, I believe that, that it's not just about being bright, but it is about being able to impact the hearts and lives of people. And that comes at a tremendous sacrifice if you're going to transform lives. I, I don't go into the bell curve at all. I, I normally tell all my students, if you all give me the work, all of you will get A's. If you don't give me the work, all of you could get F at the same time. It doesn't matter. So I don't go into the bell curve. But a question I want to ask you though, mental illness is prevalent among kids in almost all countries. And Guyana is no exception. But are teachers trained to pick this up from children and try to get them help poorly? What, what I know, we have um, we have a health and family life department, a whole section that deals with health and family life, and that has to do with screening of children um, and checking their backgrounds. And I think the Ministry of Health has now been collaborating with the Ministry of Education to move in that in that direction, because indeed, like I said. Um, then you said mental health, but there could be so many other issues too. They were just who complain that children were not, um, children were not, they're not learning anything. And the moment they put a pair of spectacles on their eyes, all of a sudden, <laughs> did you say this boy, because this boy is very bright, you know, but all the child needed was spectacles or a hearing aid or something. And so, um, but I know there's a health and family life department that address, uh, that addresses those things. Um, to what extent in terms of mental health, I can't say, but I know um, Minister Anthony from the Ministry of Health has been collaborating with the Ministry of Education to deal with some of these issues. Not just mental health, it has to do with these young girls and so on, making sure that they have their, their vaccinations and pap spray and uh, whatever it is that they do, the women do to check them out and so on. Um, I think that this human papilloma virus and so on, they, they're treated for those things and so on, tested. 
and, and so so the whole set of whole gamut of things that you would want to consider as you consider health, inclusive of, of mental health. But I can't say to what degree um, the issue of mental health has been addressed. You spoke about the role of parents, and I agree with that. But a number of parents, not only in Guyana, but in, in a number of countries, they were not educated. And if the kids are going to high school or in the upper class in a primary school and some, come home with some assignment, and the kid is struggling, they can't help that child or those children. And this was the lead to frustration among a number of children. Now, is there a way, there should be a way in Gaya to help those kids if they know the parents can't help them. But on the other hand, in Guyana, which I was checking the results there, a number of parents are doing two jobs and they're not even home when the kids get home. In New York here, they got lock keys. The kids carry a key around their necks. So that when they get home from school, they open the apartment and go inside. No parent, the parents are doing both jobs because to live in New York City is very expensive. And if you're not highly qualified, one job can't pay you to pay the rent and all the bills. So that so the kids don't see the parents until the next morning. The kid will get home, the parents will make sandwich or whatever for them, and they will eat. They'll, they'll turn the TV on, they will not do any assignments. And next morning, parents wake up to get back to school. In Guyana, parents are doing two jobs, a lot of them. They don't even see the kids in the evenings. What have you to say to those parents? What would you say to them? You know, one of the things, um, one of the things I, I believe that we have, as, as, as a people, we have degenerated into a selfish kind of um, position. And, you know, back then you had what we report as safety nets. And you remember the, you remember the saying, it takes a village to raise a child? That's that, right. That concept has been lost. Um, it's more like fight for self, as far as they dog and dog. Um, but the, the appearance like that, uh, and this is, where, this is where this whole thing about no man is an island, it has to come in because if, if we could only connect with people who can help, you have organizations um, that can help. Um, I know you have you have churches, you have the mosques, you have you know different people who could do different things um, in terms of in terms of the in terms of the assistance that that, that can be given to parents. But people have to people have to reach out, and to my mind. When they reach out, they must be a willingness. Um, they must be a willingness to help to uh, whoever they may have reached out to. They must be a willingness there. But I would say to those parents, don't give up. Um, my father, <laughs> I, you know, the one time I didn't see my father for a week. Um, that, um, he came home because he was a carpenter. He had his canvas bag with his plane, his, his, his hammer and chisel and so on, and he left. Um, he came in very late in, at night because he used to work at transport and he left early in the morning. So one time I did not see him for, for an entire week. So it was the grinding. It was the grinding that he was on. And I can remember these words. There's no, um, I have no, no problem with people who are in a trade. He did well. But you know, we have this feeling that, that um, the only way you could do well is when you become a scholar. And you have these um, these qualifications and so on. So he said to me, "I don't want you to be fetching around these tools like me. You know, do something different with your life and so on." But um, that, that, you know, but the, the grinding never gave up on me. This man was not a scholar, like I said, but he came. But you said some parents they were, they, they, you know, they don't have the. Um, the Ryan, we lost him. I think there's a blackout. Maybe. <clears throat> hmm. 
Folks, we're coming to the end of the program. I think there is a blackout and we have lost Dr. Marshall Hudson. I hope he can come back in and join us. But we just have about two minutes to go. Oh, there he is. Go ahead. Yeah. What happened? There was the internet interruption. Yeah, yeah. Look, <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but I was saying that my father, um, he played an integral role and he never gave up. I would say to those parents, don't give up. Um, life, it's a struggle. Um, but sometimes you see the reward at the end of the day. You might say that they're doing two jobs, um, three jobs, but I, I would say reach out, reach out to different ones. Reach out to people and let them know. Um, I see we have a national revision program now where a child could go now on the television and the revision is done with the child or with the children. That is happening right now. And so a number of initiatives have you know, been making. Um, we've had students where we put them together in one area and give them lessons and the lessons are paid for. You know, those kinds of things. And so um, it, it's not, we're not a hopeless um, people who are in a, in a hopeless situation as some may want to paint it. I, I believe that um, that progressively, and I think, you know, the ultimate goal of transformation is people working together in collaboration. And I think that when we have come to that, I actually teach a program at, that, you know, at my alma mater. It's called Servant Leadership. I teach at the, the doctoral level of that. And this whole thing about compassion, this whole thing about about meeting the needs of people, putting people first, and, and those kinds of things, you know, love and, and, and so on, trust, you know, the, some people might say, man, you're crazy, man, in this world you talk with compassion and empathy and love and so on, but that's what this world needs, it needs a great dose of, of empathy and compassion because that, all of us passing through, you know, all of us passing through, a time will come. <laughs> And, you know, when you listen to something, you get a sense that they don't understand we're passing through. All of us, we have an expiration date. And I think it is fundamental that we do good and we do what is right to help mankind uh, more than creating control. Yeah, brothers, keep for right. We, we, we are coming to the end of the program. Well, let me just say this. A nation's prosperity is not measured by the number of infrastructure projects or but or but by the but by the absence of poverty, good health, good education, especially the public schools, and its literacy rate. A philosopher said that. Now, Dr. Hudson, we, we come to the end of the, we are end of the program. Your closing remarks. Well, Doc, um, this has been an experience for me because I didn't know exactly what you were going to ask. You didn't give me a script. You didn't give me um, any kind of inclination. We had some, some some areas, yes, but um, I, I saw a question that came um, from way back in colonial days and so on. I think I've been able to do um, a reasonably good job, um, but I, I, I am happy for the opportunity to, to be on this program and uh, to speak to the nation. And I'm sure that at some point in time, I will be willing to be a part of this. I think you've been doing it. Um, a good job in terms of bringing some issues to light and so on. And um, but I, I just want to say that I just pray that the people of this country will really operate as one because division and separation will not cut it. The, the country will collapse if we don't work together as a team. I mean, we are different. We might have our different views or different affiliation, but at the end of the day, um, human beings could work together, even though they have their differences for the, um, for the benefit of our people. And I just want to say, and I believe that Guyana is in a good place, but we just have to start learning to reach out to one another so that we could continue to prosper and grow. So thank Dear you. Dear brothers keepers, thank you very much, Dr. Marcel Hudson. You did an ex excellent job, but the thing is we don't give people questions before the program. We tell you, give your framework of what we're going to be talking about, but we don't give you specific questions. So you, you have the framework to study from it. And you did, a, you did an excellent job. I want to say thanks to all our listeners for tuning in tonight and to Noar Singh, Devin Bissoon, and Ryan Gobin for making this program available to all our listeners far and wide. We broadcast 
from in every continent, from coast to coast. So thanks again to all our listeners. Thanks to you, Dr. Hudson, for coming on. And it's a pleasure having you. I hope sometime in the future we'll be able to rekindle and come back again and we discuss other things about education when we see more progress is being made. I want to say this to all our listeners, though, that we should push the retirement age to 62 and not 55. And I said it, I give my reasons time and time again, because at the age 55, people are in the best ability and the experience and everything else, and they will go and give that to another country. Retirement age at 62. I'm asking for better internet services. It is still very, very poor. Very, very poor. And one other question. I want to tell all the public servants, you're not the bosses of the people. You're the servants of the people. And please answer your telephones. Please answer your phone when it rings. I'm not talking about your, your cell phones, the office phones, because public servants do not answer office phones. And I'm a, I want to tell all of my listeners, when you go to any one of the ministries, any one of the departments, and a public servant tells you that they will call you, don't believe them. They never call you and call you back. 1% will call you back. 99% will not. That's the experience. A survey has been done and this has been proven. I'm not talking by guess. This is what's happening, not only in Ghana, most countries. So thanks again to all our listeners. Thanks to you, Dr. Marcel Hudson. And it was a real pleasure having you tonight. I hope you all enjoy the program. A lot of things Dr. Hudson mentioned tonight in education. Uh, some of them I did not know myself, but he was able to explain it and put it in the finest context as possible. So once again, thanks very much. Dr. Austin, don't go. Stay at the program when we get off the air. <laughs>